Hello and welcome to another Fountainhead discussion group coming to you uh, live from the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow and instructor at ARI. Uh, pretty soon I'm going to be joined by my colleague Paul Tasky. Uh, he's uh, taking the place of Keith Lockage for the time being this week. Hope we'll have him back again. But uh, let me start first with just a few announcements and reminders about what we do uh, with this broadcast. So we are talking about The Fountainhead, not only um, because it is a great book, but also because the Ayn Rand Institute sponsors uh, an essay contest. I'll give you some more details on that in a minute. But if you want to be able to ask us live questions, I know that some of you are watching on social media, on Facebook uh, and on um, uh, YouTube, but if you would like to be able to ask live direct questions or chat with us, best place to do that is through Zoom. If you go to the URL I have on the page here at courses.ironran.org, you can register uh, to participate in our Zoom discussion. Otherwise, that essay contest, we have a top prize of $10,000. There's uh, other cash prizes for uh, runner-ups. The deadline is May 28th. We will be done discussing uh, this book, uh, the entirety of it leaving you time to do that in time for that deadline. So uh, if you if you want to learn more, uh, please go to the website I have on the slide here. Uh, also a great another great source of content from the Institute about Ayn Rand's ideas, novels and philosophy is the Ayn Rand University app. You can get that through the Android or the iOS store on your smartphone. It's it's hundreds and hundreds of hours of lectures and courses that you can sample from to your heart's delight. Uh, I also have an announcement to make about our schedule. Now, uh, today's May 1st. We're talking about part three of The Fountainhead. Next week, uh, Friday, we're going to be talking about the first half of part four. The week after that, we had been scheduled to talk about the second half and final part of the book, second half of part four. Uh, however, we've decided to cancel and reschedule that week because uh, the, that week we will be doing a event that I'm trying to put the slide up for, but it's uh, not cooperating with me for some reason. Um, we have an online uh, objectivist conference, uh, Ocon Live, Living a Life of Purpose. Uh, and uh, although I wasn't able to get the URL on the screen as I had hoped to, the URL for that is einrand.org slash Ocon Live. Uh, that is a two-day online conference, Friday and Saturday, uh, dealing with the timeless question of what it means to live a life of meaning and purpose uh, from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy. So if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, go and see what the options are, see what the speakers are. You can sign up at einrand.org slash Ocon Live. Um, and uh, we will then be rescheduling the uh, event uh, for the Fountainhead group, which was to happen on Friday, May 15th, for the subsequent week. That week, we had originally planned on doing uh, just an hour of Q&A. So we're going to, uh, for the final week, May 21st, do two hours, one hour of discussing the final uh, portion of the reading and another hour uh, of Q&A. So it'll be a two-hour event. That'll be our final event. Uh, so we're not canceling, we're just rescheduling it. Um, okay. So let me then go ahead and stop my screen share so that I can bring Paul onto the screen. Hi, Paul. Hi, Ben. Good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for being with us this week. And um, uh, Paul, I think you wanted to start by bringing the readers up to speed and uh, reminding them about the context of this uh, part three of The Fountainhead, which we are now discussing. Yeah, it, so in case anyone's just joining us and they maybe didn't read part three or reread it, just a little bit of context setting so you know what we'll be talking about for the duration of the session. So just like in part two, here we get a, an extensive background into one of our main characters, Gail Winand, who's introduced in person for the first time here. Um, and with that, the stage is set and we have essentially all the main characters introduced. You know, um, uh, Ellsworth Tui is 
back at his old tricks and essentially he's trying to further the career of Peter Keating by securing for him uh, this project of Stone Ridge, which Gail Winan is putting on. And he, he's able to do this uh, through the exchange of the Stoddard Temple statue of Dominique and giving that as a present to Winand. After Winand sees the statue, he agrees to meet with Dominique and he eventually agrees to allow Keating to build Stone Ridge if he allows Dominique to sleep with him. Winand goes further than that, however, and pays Keating additional funds to divorce Dominique and then remarries her himself. We also see Tui's influence expanding into other cultural spheres beyond architecture. You know, his reach into the fields of theater and literature are expanding by ways of the gallant gallstone and the play No Skin Off Your Nose, which we see featured in this part. Uh, we also get a glimpse of Rourke here. After his trial, he continues to build and receive some smaller projects, but there's a general feeling by other characters that he is done for professionally speaking. Dominique and Wynand are married and Dominique tries to make herself unhappy just like she did in her marriage to Peter Keating, but she grows to like Wynand anyway. Dominique eventually tries to warn Wynand about Tui and tries to tell him that Tui is a dangerous character, urges Wynand to fire Tui, but Wynand won't hear of it. And despite Wynand, or Dominique's growing affection for Wynand, she openly admits that she does not love him, but Wynand is unbothered by this. He says that nothing can, you know, nothing can damage his love for her, not even the fact that she doesn't love him back. Is there anything you want to add in terms of setting the context, Ben? No, I think that's that's fine. I mean, the the main thing going on in this in this section is we're we're finally getting to meet Gail Wynand, who's only been really hinted at. His presence has only been hinted at. In, in previous uh, parts of the book. We know that he runs this paper that's kind of a yellow press journalistic outfit, uh, despised by people like Henry Cameron. Rourke seems to share in that assessment. We know that Dominique works for him. We know that he fires Dominique when she stands up for uh, the, the Stoddard Temple, but we don't know too much about who he is or why he does uh, what he does. And we get a real window into his soul in this part of the book, especially right at the beginning, uh, where, as you mentioned, we get uh, background information about him. It comes by way of a flashback where he's, he's contemplating suicide. And the reason the flashback happens is because he wants to kind of relive his life and see if it's worth continuing. Uh, and that's really where we get a lot of window into his soul. And so one of the questions that we asked uh, in advance was what motivates Winans, especially given what you see from his own recollection of his own life, what motivates his choice of career and his approach to dealing with other people, especially um, interestingly men of integrity? And then how do those motives compare and uh, compare to someone like Dominique's? So Paul, I know you wanted to outline some of the kind of data that we have to go on to figure out why he does what he does. Yeah, so Rand gives us a lot of information, like you're saying, about Winan's entire past, his childhood, his whole development, and then, you know, it culminates back to living in the present. And we see a lot of things happened in Winan's life that influences his choice of career. He grew up poor in the gutter and started working from a young age. He held lots of different jobs. He was a newspaper boy, a greengrocer. He cleaned up spittoons and cleaned up after drunk people. He eventually became a leader of a street gang uh, after a pretty gruesome fight, uh, but he managed to win it despite essentially being described as just skin and bones. Um, but he, and then he takes a step back and tries to look at the differences between where he grew up in the slums in Hell's Kitchen and people that are well-to-do, the wealthy, people that live in places like Fifth Avenue. And he noticed one huge difference is that the people in the wealthy areas read a lot of books. And so he decides to learn all that he can by reading as much as he can. Eventually, he lands a job as at the Gazette, first as a reporter, then as an associate editor, 
before finally working his way up to owner of the Gazette, taking it over kind of hostily and rechristening it the New York Banner. And he eventually is able to go and create his entire entertainment empire. And that's kind of, that's kind of a brief sketch of Winans um, development and, and just life story. It seems like the, the, the story doesn't just end with his printing newspapers and becoming a successful newspaperman, right? He, he, he seems to have, I don't know, you might describe it as a side hobby. Yeah, it's- And what is that? It's a strange side hobby. He likes to essentially, he likes to destroy people. Uh, he likes to crush their spirits. Specifically, he likes to crush the spirits of what are called men of integrity. Um, he has a lot of experiences growing up where he sees people that, you know, when you're younger, he thinks they have integrity. One of the, one of the prime examples that Rand gives is there's an editor of another paper who wrote this editorial that Wine and Views as, quote, the most beautiful tribute to integrity he had ever read, unquote. And he goes to this person to try and defend uh, uh, someone under fire in the media. And when he presents the story, he says to the reporter, do you remember writing this? And he's confronted with a response that says, how do you expect me to remember every piece of swill I write? So he sees that this reporter doesn't really care about integrity, about what he said before. He just wrote something because he felt like it or because he had to. There was no underlying principle or justification uh, or consistency in that person's positions. And that really hurt him. And so he, he ultimately concludes that there really aren't people of integrity in the world. And he, pri he prides himself on never needing to learn a lesson twice. He understands from this experience that people lack integrity and they will only pay lip service to it when and as it suits them. Uh, he Paul, intends... just to, oh, to break in a bit there because it, there's an important point about the form in which he decides not to uh, need to learn the same lesson twice, which is after he goes to that editor, remember the, the editor is the one he, he had gone to when he finds out that this man of integrity, Pat Mulligan, had been uh, unjustly attacked and he had initially wanted to attack Pat Mulligan. So it's after he goes to the hypocritical editor that Wynand himself then pens a column attacking Mulligan, even though he himself had originally thought Mulligan was an honest man. And it's not that he's discovered something about Mulligan that changes his mind. Uh, it's, it's something about the reaction of that columnist that does it. That's really important. We'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Yeah, it's it's definitely those the the columnist that changes Winans' mind and perspective of, of what he needs to do as a reporter, as a writer, in response to this attack. Uh, and he, you know, he goes full force and destroys the man's career. Essentially, he joins on the bandwagon. Um, and not just him, right? Yeah, no, uh, not just him. I mean, he he goes on and kind of this begins his life crusade that he really picks up with full steam to, to unmask other pretenders, uh, people that will masquerade as having integrity. Um, he, he understands that because they only pay lip service to them, that you can buy these people who claim to have integrity, claim to stand for a cause or claim to have something that's really dear to them, you know, as long as you offer them enough money or the right price. And so he really goes after people. The first example we get of this afterward is Dwight Carson, who's a champion of individualism. Wynand essentially buys him lock, stock and barrel and hires him for the banner and makes him write in praise of collectivism, of the good of the collective and to damn the individual. You know, and we get several other examples of this. You know, he makes sensitive poets, comment on baseball games. He makes socialists praise, you know, industrialists and capitalism. He really just takes full pleasure in breaking these people. But then once he breaks them, he loses all interest. It's an interesting question. I think uh, you, the way you put it was he's, he's looking for people who are pretending 
to have integrity or paying lip service to it. But I think it's an interesting question of whether that's totally true of these people, at least at first. I mean, obviously, once he breaks them, once he buys them off and, and uh, they decide to accede to his demands, you could argue they, you know, they, don't, they certainly don't mean it anymore. Uh, but it's an interesting question. Well, did they mean it before? Uh, and did he just find the, you know, the weak spot that, that made them give up what they were previously honestly doing? Um, but it's, it's not, I don't think it's totally clear uh, from the way that the story is, is told. Um, but it's, it's perplexing behavior, Paul. I mean, why, I mean, why do you think he's doing this? What's, what's motivating him? And I'd like to also just um, ask other people in the chat on Zoom if they have ideas about why he's doing what he's doing. Why yeah, is he I trying to break these people? I think there are a couple of things that really influence why Wynand is acting in the way that he does later on in his life. And one of those things that really set the tone for him is this constant refrain that he hears throughout his childhood is that you don't run things around here. And so every action that he took from a young age has essentially been to be able to run things. And, and you know, now that he does run things, he can take certain actions that he wants to take, like breaking those men who claim to have integrity. Um, but he, he wants to understand those differences between the slums and Fifth Avenue. And he begins to, you know, he begins to really read and try to push himself to be, to, to be better. And he sees that he doesn't have to work all that hard work. He seems to be naturally gifted and teachers and other people in his life can appreciate that, but then they'll get tired of it because they have to, you know, teach down to the masses. They have to, you know, help those who are not as naturally gifted, who uh, can't grasp things quite so quickly as he can. But so once he's educated himself, he wants to then shape that public opinion. Those people that, you know, were the primary focus of teachers and others throughout his uh, childhood. And he thinks that newspapers are the way to do that. Um, and so he, as he cements his control over the banner, um, he's able to you know, then shape public opinion by really keeping the banner's story in line with public opinion. And this is how he, he uses that power of public opinion to shape public opinion further, to really amplify it, and even to shape some government policy later on. But I, I'm curious though, Paul, I mean, it seems like he's got the power. He's got all the power he could ever use, or at least it seems that way, if you understand power in a conventional way. What explains the wanting to break people of integrity? Uh, what does that get him? What what extra power or influence or what does that get? I mean, I guess it's a demonstration of power, but why why does he relish in that particular power so much, do you think? I think he relishes in the power to break people, the people that claim to have integrity, because it's satisfying to him to know that he was right. He he sees and he saw early early on, that people don't have this proclaimed integrity. And so it, it reinforces that mindset every time that he's able to break someone, whether it's Dwight Carson, whether it's the sensitive poet, or anyone else who claims to really stand for something, hold something really dear to them, and he's able to buy them off. He reinforces to himself his own view of people. And I, I think that's a really big driving factor for him, that satisfaction that he gets. Okay. I, mean, I, I know that you wanted to talk uh, more about Dominique comparing and contrasting, but I think we should, I think we should follow this thread of thought uh, first to mm -hmm. get a little clearer on why he does that. Because the next follow-up question would be, well, why does he want so badly to convince himself uh, that there are no men of integrity? Why does he want to convince himself that he was so right about that? Uh, and 
you can really trace it back to that decision with Mulligan. Because we're not actually told uh, whether Mulligan sells out after he's been attacked uh, in the way that we are, let's say, with some of the other people that he buys off. All we know is that he ruins Mulligan. Uh, all we know is that he thought Mulligan was an honest man. We find out that the editor who wrote the column doesn't care about it. And without any changing facts about Mulligan, Wynan decides to destroy him. So he did have some evidence that people had integrity in the form of this Mulligan guy, and yet he decides he wants to destroy him anyway, and his destruction doesn't um, you know, prove him right in this case. So there's, I think there's more we need to know about uh, why he does what he does. Now, there's some interesting things coming in in the chat. Sophia says, well, it will justify his own lack of integrity, won't it? And that's an interesting point. Uh, Tessa says he's given up his integrity to prove those who, uh, and to prove those who have it really don't, he wants to make himself feel better. I think those are both important points. The question, if that's true, is uh, why has he himself decided to lose his integrity? Why has he decided, especially in a case like that Mulligan example, um, to betray Mulligan? P presumably that's, if it's a betrayal, if he's found no evidence that no Mulligan actually did do something wrong, uh, then it's, yeah, I think you all are right that it's, it's, uh, it's Wynand who lacks the integrity. And so Wynand's trying to justify himself in a way. And it's interesting to look at that scene with Mulligan to get a clue as to what I think is going on there. So, Paul, you mentioned the part about how uh, it's uh, the he expresses gratitude to the columnist as payment for a lesson he would never need to learn again. But then in the next paragraph, I think there's something really significant. This is in the middle of page 407. Uh, he felt only a furious contempt for himself, for Pat Mulligan, for all integrity. He felt shame when he thought of those whose victims he and Mulligan had been willing to become. He did not think victims. He thought suckers. He got back to his office and wrote a brilliant editorial blasting Captain Mulligan. And there's a few other things that he says like this on uh, in relation to some of the other uh, people that he tries to break. So later on page 412, there's a young newspaperman who uh, he tries to hire. And the guy says, I don't want to work for you because you don't have any ideals. And he says, you can't escape human depravity, kid. Uh, the boss you work for may have ideals, but he has to beg money and take orders from many contemptible people. I have no ideals, but I don't beg. Take your choice. There is no other. And then later, toward the end of the reading, after Dominique takes him to that play, No Skin Off Your Nose, and Dominique complains, and we'll talk more about this later, and she complains, this is the lousy play that your paper promoted and you are you very proud of that and he says I mean, he agrees with her that it's a lousy play but he says what's worse than supporting a trashy play is writing a great play for fools to laugh at thereby letting oneself be martyred by these kind of people what i think is in common to all of these cases is he thinks that if he has integrity, if he stands by ideals, if he promotes idealistic causes or defends honest people, he's going to be a sucker and he's going to be laughed at by contemptible people. And he's afraid of that. It shames him to do it. Uh, and so at the core of all of this is is a fear 
of the very mob that he has or claims to have such contempt for. He fears their disapproval. He's ashamed of their disapproval. And so in that respect, uh, there are people in uh, the chat who've been asking about, I think Sophia in particular asked about his role as a second hander. Now that's language that we haven't yet brought into this discussion because I don't think it's actually come up in the book yet. It's going to later, but what it points to is people like Peter Keating. We have talked a fair amount about Peter Keating and we've talked about how Keating only cares really about what other people think and he doesn't wanna make choices on his own and he wants to instead defer to the standards and judgments and values of others. And of course, there's a lot of differences between Keating and Wynand for sure, um, especially the way they start out in life. But here it seems there's an interesting similarity and Wynan's pursuit of power is, is not an end in itself. It's, it's a means to that end. Uh, and uh, Grant is asking in the chat, where is the evidence that he fears their disapproval? Well, uh, Grant, it's, it's, it's the lines that I quoted, the thinking that he would be a sucker if he were to stand by Mulligan. And the not wanting to be martyred in front of people uh, who will laugh. And uh, there's a few other uh, things like that. I mean, there's some real differences again between Keating and, and Wynand. And Paul, you, you highlighted those. I mean, he starts out, he starts out very idealistic. He had, part of the reason why he empathizes with Pat Mulligan to begin with is because he's, he sees in him a, a, a common spirit. Uh, and even after uh, everything that's happened with his paper, we'll talk more about how he retains those ideals in this uh, arrested development form. Yet yeah, he's very but, disillusioned with the world as a whole. He, you know, he no longer sees a value in in trying to present these integrity filled people, you know, to the public because he sees that the public doesn't appreciate them. And the public ultimately has the power to, to make, to lift people up or tear them down. And he doesn't want to get torn down. Um, you know, like you were saying, Ben, when you brought up no skin off your nose, you know, the people were laughing at this play and, you know, praising the one, the, the, uh, the playwright about just how funny and how insightful, how great it was. And when he says to Dominique, when they're talking about the play back and forth, it would be so much worse to try and give them something, you know, actually great. Because then the Stoddard Temple would happen. That's exactly what happened with the Stoddard Temple. Mm -hmm. Right. And by this point, he knows that he knows that this was what happened to Rourke. He doesn't know Rourke personally yet, uh, but it's uh, that's the kind of thing he wants to avoid. And yeah, and that same uh, early, roughly in the middle of the reading, page 445, he talks about how he has total passion for the total height. He retains his ideals in the form of his art gallery, starts to kind of grow again when he meets Dominique. But toward the end, uh, he says that he loves the heroic, but he doesn't believe in it. That's page 498. Um, so let's let's go back to Dominique then for a moment. Um, what did you think were the major similarities and differences between his motives and hers, Paul? So Dominique to me has always been the most complex and difficult to pin down character. But I do think that when you look at her in comparison to Wynand, you see a certain similarity in that you know, they both kind of take a similar approach in that they want to destroy or, or break those men of ability, but they do it for different reasons. Dominique recognizes, first of all, that there are men of integrity and that that's, you know, that those people are great, not in a pure way that she needs to break them down, kind of like Wynan does with, uh, with the people that he hires for the banner, but because she doesn't think that the world deserves them. Um, 
she, you know, she wants to destroy Rourke because she thinks Rourke is too good for the world. Not that, you know, Rourke just hasn't been confronted with, you know, the right number to, to stop him from creating buildings the way he wants. Um, and she, she really goes about in a way that she wants to destroy, Dominique wants to destroy their ability to create art, whereas Wynan wants to preserve the art for himself. He wants to destroy the man or the artist, but keep the art created by that person, which I think is you know, interesting when you look back at his purchasing of Stephen Mallory's work after he sees the Stoddard Temple statue of Dominique, you know, he has no desire to meet Stephen Mallory because the artist always disappoints him when, you, when he looks at the art they created because the artist doesn't measure up. And so he's willing to take in these, these little treasures for himself and say, okay, you know, these are a great comfort to him and they really help him you know, th this is what the world could be like. And Dominique doesn't even want the world to have those things. She says the world doesn't deserve them. And so they have to be destroyed. Even though she has strong feelings, as we know, for Rourke, and we see that again when she goes to see him in, during this part of the novel. Yeah, the way that I would summarize uh, the difference between the two of them is, I mean, you're right that there's ways in which both of them want to... Uh, destroy or f at least uh, fight against uh, people who actually have integrity. The difference is that Wynand is doing it because he doesn't believe they really have it and he wants to convince himself of that. Dominique does. She, she thinks it's real. She thinks heroes are real. She doesn't think that Rourke is secretly compromised or something like that. The reason she wants to destroy Rourke is to protect him from the world and thereby to protect herself because she doesn't want to see him destroyed. She's, she's afraid of the loss that that will entail. Uh, so it's a, it's a different motivation um, because Dominique hasn't committed this, the, the same kind of, same kind of, uh, breach of integrity as Wynand has. She's not trying to convince herself of something to justify herself. But what's similar is that they both do fear the world in different ways, but they both fear the world's disapproval. That's why Wynand wants to have power over it so that he won't be disapproved of, so that he won't be laughed at. Dominique fears it because uh, she she thinks integrity is real and thinks it can destroy it. Though I will they both think that that world is, it has that kind of power. That the one we'll have to see if, if they're right. To note is that Dominique doesn't fear this for her own sake. She doesn't fear being broken by the world. She fears it for other creators like Rourke. She thinks that the world will end up breaking him. Well, I think it, they go hand in hand because she loves Rourke. Mm -hmm. And the way that she's always described herself is she wants to be free from desire. She wants to be free uh, from valuing things in the world because if she loses them, the pain will be too much. Uh, so I would like to move on soon to the next question, but I thought it would be interesting to uh, wrap up our discussion of this first one just by... Um, since we've been talking about Wynan's view about his own power, uh, there's this story that crops up from time to time in the reading about the book by Lois Cook, The Gallant Gallstone. And it's the story of a, of, a, of a gallstone that's supposed to prove there's no free will. Now, part I'm sure of what's going on here is that uh, this is expressing a viewpoint that people like Lois Cook and uh, Ellsworth Tui have a lot of reason to try to promulgate. And we'll talk more about uh, what uh, purpose that serves for them shortly. But read a different way, you have to wonder if there's some kind of dramatic irony going on here, uh, given the fact that the story is now being promoted by, of all places, the New York banner. 
Here's the description. It's all about a goal. This is page 394. It's all about a gallstone that thinks it's an independent entity, a sort of rugged individualist of the gallbladder. If you see what I mean, and then the man takes a big dose of castor oil, there's a graphic description of the consequences. I'm not sure it's correct medically, but anyway, that's the end of the gallstone. Uh, Wynand thinks that he has power uh, in virtue of his control of the banner. But he's acquired it in this way that we've just talked about and for this end that we've just talked about. We'll have to see what happens to him. Uh, but to moving to the second question, which, which draws on something that Wynand himself said, I think in one of his better moments, as I mentioned before, he, he occasionally expresses his uh, belief. He expresses these ideals, but he doesn't really believe in them. Uh, and at one point, uh, page 437, he says to Dominique that a quest for self-respect is a proof of its lack. Now, the reason that he says that is because he sees Dominique doing something quite the opposite. He says, well, a quest for self-contempt uh, must also uh, prove to be impossible uh, to achieve. He's suggesting that she's on a quest for self-contempt, but only a person with self-respect would need to do that. And such a person is not going to be able to succeed in their quest. But that's prefaced with quest for self-respect is a proof of its lack. I think it's important that this discussion of self-respect and how a quest for it's a proof of its lack happens at this point in, this, in the reading because there's a lot in this reading and even leading up to it that we can understand uh, various characters and their actions that we can understand using this dictum. And Paul, I know you had some thoughts on that and, and I've got some too. So I'd, I'd be curious to see also people in the chat. Are there people we've met in the course of this story so far who seem to be on a quest for self-respect, but the way they engage in it proves that they don't have any to begin with? What do you all think? So Paul? So I'll start off. I When I read this question in preparing for the session, I thought of two characters after I reread this, this uh, section. One was, of course, Peter Keating, who is constantly trying to seek respect through the eyes of others. You know, he wants to be told he's great by, you know, he wants to get the respect of Guy Franken. He wants to get the respect of his mother, of Ellsworth Tuohy, of all the other architects, Ralston Holcomb, anyone else. You know, you know, he's the quintessential, in my mind, example of this, trying to achieve self-respect self -respect through a sort of quest and, and really just trying to get others to give him that validation. And then the other that I thought of, and she, she's not as big a character as Peter Keating, but it's Catherine Halsey. And, you know, I almost feel bad for Catherine because, she, or I do feel bad for Catherine because I think her quest, she really wants to feel you know, she wants to do something worthwhile and she wants to live a life of meaning and she really looks for that, but she looks for it by trying to get her uncle's advice and her uncle's advice is always, you know, you're being too selfish, you're being this, you're being that. And so she takes his advice to heart and really tries to live the way uh, her uncle wants her to. And this, um, you know, in seeking self-respect through Tui's estimation of what that should look like, really damages her. And so I, I think when Wynan is saying that, it calls to mind those two characters for me specifically, you know, of the of the damage that it can do to try and look for self-respect through the eyes of other people. Uh, but Ben, did you have other characters or instances that you thought? Yeah, I, mean, I think funny? you're right about both of those. Um, and it's worth thinking about uh, Especially, especially Keating. Um, there's a lot of very concrete examples of this kind of thing. Uh, not only, uh, not only you know, leading up to this reading, but there's some really telling examples of it in this reading. So, page uh, 420. He's gotten everything he wants. He's gotten the Cosmos Slotnik building. Now he's even gotten Dominique, who he thought was an impossible uh, wife. She would never marry him. 
And he says, he thought of how convincingly he could describe this scene to friends and make them envy the fullness of his contentment. Why couldn't he convince himself he had everything he ever wanted? So he's trying to convince himself that he's content. The fact that he can't is interesting. Um, when there's a, a crucial scene that we'll spend more time talking about when we get to question three between him and Dominique, where she, he says, where's your eye, Dominique? And, he, and she says, where's yours? For reasons we'll shortly discuss, he's beginning to see that there's a point to her question that maybe he doesn't have one. And right when Dominique says the worst thing is to kill a man's pretense at self-respect, he suddenly clams up, doesn't want to talk, slams his mind, before the words that would pre preserve his knowledge of the pity that she is taking on him for having this pretense of self-respect. So here it's, he realized that he was, not only did he realize he doesn't seem to have any self-respect, he's also starting to realize that he's trying to fake it. And now he's trying to fake the fact that he's faking it by shutting his mind on the realization of that. Uh, and I mentioned the gallant gallstone before. As soon as the scene between Dominique and Tui is over, sorry, between Dominique and Keating is over, Tui comes in. And Keating's so relieved because Tui is there to provide some comfort for him, respite from the very awkward conversation he's just had with Dominique. And the first thing out of his mouth is talking about, I've just finished reading The Gallant Gallstone and oh, we can't help what we are or who we, what we do. It's not our fault. Nobody's to blame for anything. It's all in your background and your glands. If you're good, that's no achievement of yours. You were lucky. If you're rotten, nobody should punish you. You were unlucky. That's all. As they say in the theater, he protests too much, one thinks, here. Uh, he, he knows he's done some rotten things. Ellen in the chat says it's worse than that. Peter gave up his values. He had the capacity to be different, but made uh, decisions that he, he could have done otherwise. Yeah, he realizes that. And so it's a convenient rationalization to be able to say, oh, I'm really just like the gallant gallstone and I couldn't help what I did. It's all in my glands or in the glands of this, the, the larger body of society that I'm just an organ in. I think, um, I think Ellen's point is reinforced by a point Grant made earlier in the chat, and he, he noted the opening scene of, of Keating in the graduation ceremony that we saw in part one. But, you know, all throughout the story, he really does build on this, you know, you know, he's constantly at every turn making these decisions of, of not making his own choices, of, of putting no eye forward, just trying to go by what is the most popular or what will get him the most acclaim not really sticking to anything in particular. There's some telling little uh, additional touches along the same lines. Page 441, when Wynand offers him Stone Ridge, Stone Ridge in effect for sleeping with Dominic. He's selling his wife uh, to this contemptible person in his view uh, to get an architectural commission that he doesn't really need. Uh, and he's, he's looking at this Aspic, which is a, a kind of jello. I don't know what you mean, Mr. Wan, and whispered Keating. His eyes were fixated upon the tomato aspic on his salad plate. It was soft and shivering. It made him sick. And uh, then further on, Keating thought he must speak again, but he couldn't. Not as long as that salad was there before him. Oh, the terror came from that plate, not from the fastidious monster across the table. The rest of the room was warm and safe. He lurched forward and his elbow swept the plate off the table. Um, and then after he finally sells her, he gets this big check. And what does he have to do? He has to give it to Tui to, you know, spend it on a good cause. That'll make me feel better. Like I didn't actually just sell my wife uh, for a, a commission. Um, we could go on and on with this kind of thing. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll just mention, I think the whole scene with artists, the Council of American Writers, who are all trying to say, well, it's a good play, Ike the Genius that you wrote, and it's good because it's so bad, and Jules Fogler, uh, 
you know, anybody can review a good play, but it, it takes real skill to review a bad play and make it successful. And like they're all doing the same thing. They're all uh, trying to come up with a rationalization for why their lousiness as artists is actually a good thing because of some kind of trick that they're able to pull on people because of it. And then very interestingly, Keating enters at the end and he doesn't seem to be hip to their game yet. But then the fact that they're going to be able to fool him is just another uh, uh, feather in their cap in effect. But and I'll just, I'll just yeah, add one other point before we wrap this up and move on is that you really see that this kind of, this whole thing topples down as soon as, as soon as they don't get that validation externally that they've been craving this whole time, particularly we see this with Keating, where you see an example of Tui praising a different architect. I think mm -hmm. it's Gus Webb that he praises one time. Uh, and Tui's like, hey, why didn't you, why didn't you give me that validation or that praise? And, and Tui brushes it off. Oh, oh, Peter, you know, it's just one small thing. Let him have this. He needs it more than you. And so, you know, you see that as soon as they don't get this external validation, you know, their world starts to crumble and, and Keating is really affected by that. But there are going to be other rationalizations that they're going to be given at that point about why, well, you're not that important. And what matters is that you do good for greater causes. And that will still help salvage uh, their uh, remnant of kind of pseudo self-respect. Last mm -hmm. thing I, I do have to say is that, I mean, this quotation came from Wynand in the first place, but there's a lot of ways in which it's true of him too. And for the reasons that we talked about before, we talked about how he's trying to convince himself that integrity doesn't exist. Uh, and if that's true, then nobody could expect him to try to have any integrity of his own, right? So everything he does, except to the extent that he maintains some core ideals left over from his youth, uh, is trying to prove, trying to acquire self-respect that he doesn't actually have. Um, I mean, I think the big exception to that is the art gallery and his love for Dominique. Um, but there's, for him, these are exceptions. Mm -hmm. Love is exception making. It's an exception to his general policy. Uh, and it's not, uh, these aren't ways that he's trying to prove that he has self-respect to himself. They're just the last remnants of what self-respect that he has. With everything else that he does, there is where he needs to prove it. And there's where he doesn't have it. So the last big question that we asked was uh, related to the second question, because um, one thing you could ask about what we've just discussed uh, about, and we, we looked at examples of people who lack self-respect and therefore try to fake it to themselves. Why do they lack it in the first place? What is self-respect? Where does it actually come from? This is a crucial and fundamental question for the entire novel. One of the things that we talked about in the first few weeks of this discussion group was there are different peoples, there are different people and the different characters in the story who each claim to be selfish. At one point, Keating does, he says everybody's selfish. Another point, Rourke does too. Like when he says that was the most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. Well, if we want to understand what it means to be selfish, we need to understand a little something about what what is the self that you're being selfish about? And so we asked this question, what do we learn in this reading about the author's view, about Rand's view? I think you can begin to infer her view insofar as it's shared by a number of different characters. What do we learn about her view of the nature of the soul or the self? How does this help us understand the difference uh, between say Keating and Rourke? And what does it mean about Wynand, for instance. And Paul, um, there's one scene in this reading where this comes out more explicitly than anywhere else. Um, do you happen to remember where that was? 
Uh, are you talking about the conversation between Keating and Dominique or mm -hmm. are, you, are you thinking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the page number exactly. But it's the one where uh, Keating is complaining that Dominique isn't, uh, doesn't have any views of her own. She's not she, sharing she any opinions. Right. Uh, this, that she's it's dead, but her body moves. That's yeah, it's all. page 425, 426. How does that, what's, what, what do you think is the crucial um, passage? I mean, I referred to it earlier, uh, so I guess I can just go right to it. Um, she's refusing to state preferences and opinions. Keating, as you mentioned, Paul says, it's like you're dead. It's not like you're not really alive. Well, your body moves, but that's all. The other, the thing inside you, you're, oh, don't misunderstanding me. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking religion, but there's no other word for it. So I'll say your soul, your soul doesn't exist. No will, no meaning. There's no real you anymore. It's not just the body, it's the soul. And Dominique asks him, what is the soul? And she's asking a, a sincere question there. And he says, it's you, the thing inside you. And she says, the thing that thinks and values and makes decisions. And he says, yes, yes, that's it. And the thing that feels, you've, you've given it up. And she says, so there are two things one can't give up, one's thoughts and one's desires. And skipping a little bit, he says, you're not here, Dominique. You are not alive. Where is your eye? But then very crucially, she says, where's yours, Peter? She asked quietly. And that's when he then has this uh, series of denials uh, that we talked about earlier. Notably in the same scene after two, he comes in, he says he would, he would give his soul to get Stone Ridge. To himself says he'd give his life uh, for the New York banner. This idea that the self is the thing that thinks and values and make decisions and feels. Uh, I think it's safe to say at this point that this is the view of the author. It is not what everybody means by the self, but if you think about the way we use the word, I myself think and feel and do and choose, and it is your I that does all of these things. Yeah, in the chat, uh, Ellen and Steve are making similar points about, you know, the self is your ability to choose and your ability to choose values and then sticking by them, standing by those things that you've chosen as worthy of, you know, of the fact that you chose them. Yeah, and, and so getting then to how this view explains the difference between Keating on the one hand, for instance, and Rourke. Well, we've already talked a lot in this discussion group about how Keating uh, doesn't have his own, doesn't make his own choices. He defers to the values and desires of others like his mother, uh, his, uh, you know, the opinion of his peers, the traditions in architecture, et cetera. Uh, and will even change with the wind uh, when those change, and you see this happening in this in this in this reading we've done, right? Because he used to do the classical architecture, but now modern architecture of a type is becoming popular, and he wants to compromise with that when he's designing Stone Ridge, Stone Ridge, and other other projects. But there's there have been a lot of other characters like him. If you go back to Part One, Chapter Thirteen, there's a whole series of interviews that Rourke does with uh, potential clients, and these are the the conventional ones who uh, end up not actually wanting to hire him. Mrs. Wayne Wilmot, for instance, was described as there was no such person as her, only a shell containing opinions of her friends, picture postcards she'd seen, novels of country squires. So she has no self in this view. Mr. Robert L. Mundy, he's the one who wanted to have the plantation home. No such per there's no such person as him, only the remnants of the people who lived in the Randall place. That's pages 162, 164. Um, and then when Rourke finally gets through to some of them, uh, Nathaniel Jance is able to, 
he's able to persuade him for a while, but he can't get past the board. And when he's speaking to the board, he feels like he's addressing no one. Uh, but this kind of self that Keating lacks is the kind that someone like Rourke very much has. It's the reason why when Dominique comes to him in 2.14 and says, what if, we, you know, what if I just uh, uh, marry you and we live only for each other? He won't have anything to do with that. This is where he says, to say I love you, one must be able to say the I. If, if Dominique were to live only for him, she wouldn't be anything. She'd have no self. She wouldn't be able to love. And she wouldn't be anyone that Rourke himself could love. It's the same issue that's discussed in that scene between Catherine and Tui when she wonders, uh, well, if I give up my personal identity, uh, how am I going to enter the gates in heaven? What will be left of me? What identity will I have? What will be the me there? Who, who will I be? And Keating, sorry, Tui treats it as a, a smart crack, but she's got her finger on something very important there. And Paul, do you want to read the passage from Stephen Mallory where we really get a description of how Rourke does have a self, differs from these people who don't have a self? The one sure. from page 452. Yeah, sure. I can read that. And as Ben said, it's on 452 if anyone wants to follow along. Mallory says, I often think that he's the only one of us who's achieved immortality. I don't mean in the sense of fame, and I don't mean that he won't die someday, but he's living it. I think, <clears throat> I think he is what the conception really means. You know how people long to be eternal, but they die with every day that passes. When you meet them, they're not what, they, they're, they're not what you met last. In any given hour, they kill some part of themselves. They change, they deny, they contradict, and they call it growth. At the end, there's nothing left, nothing unreserved or unbetrayed, <clears throat> as if they had never been an entity, only a succession of adjectives fading in and out of an unformed mass. How do they expect a permanence, uh, a permanence which they had never held for a single moment? But Howard Rourke, one can imagine him existing forever. Yeah, that's the contrast. We'd also asked how it applied to Wynand. I don't think we have time to talk too much, but I think it's important that at the beginning of the reading, he has no desire to do anything. Uh, and at the end, he says that there's something important about having that desire. Uh, He's, and he says he's never had it. He's never had anything that he can really call his own. So Wynand is someone who had a self, who had ideals, who had values, but he's betrayed them and he's, he's struggling to stay alive. And Dominique rekindles the fight in him and we'll have to see how this turns out at the end. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of drama still to come. And... I think we should take at least a few minutes to try to answer some questions, uh, maybe go a little longer than we usually do. And I'll look at the, the ones we have left open here. Um, so Steve asks, both Gail Wynand and Ellsworth Tui use power over men to achieve their aims. Rourke was an enemy of Tui, but a friend of Wynand. How do you explain this? Um, Steve, I think it's a really good question. Uh, you're, you're spoiling it to an extent because we, we haven't yet gotten to the point where Rourke and Tui uh, become friends. Um, but it's not a huge spoiler, so that is going to happen. And um, I, I think it'll have to do with differences between Wynand and Tui. I mean, I think you're right that they're both using power. Uh, they're doing it, though, for slightly different reasons and with a different history. I mean. Wynan does start out uh, as, as a very independent idealistic type. And uh, obviously he's compromised that a lot by this time in the novel. But uh, Rourke, as Dominique knows, I mean, Dominique discovers this side of him and it is part of why 
The marriage isn't working out the way she planned. She was hoping she'd be marrying somebody contemptible, but it turns out you no, know, he does have this kind of veiled total passion for the total height and his art gallery and whatnot. So there's something left to Wynand uh, that we don't have any evidence of, of thinking Tui has. And it's very interesting, the exchanges between the two of them. When Tui brings Wynand the statue, thinking, uh, oh, Wynand is just going to want to sleep with the model. And no, what he wants to know about is the artist. And Wynand is disappointed in Tui. Tui really just wanted to be a pimp. Uh, and uh, Tui is a little uh, put off because of that. He, he miscalculated. There's a number of ways in which Tui miscalculates against Wynand in this chapter. And you see the differences between the two of them in this regard. Um, I mean, but this, this goes on, you know, the different interactions between the different characters, their different estimations of each other. Dominique's and Wynand's estimation of Tui, for example, just vastly different in the way they interact with him. You know, Dominique kind of enjoys Tui, you know, up until toward the end of part three, where she thinks that he becomes dangerous to Wynand, but, and Wynand just has basically indifference and disdain for Tui. Oh, he's, he's nobody important. And so just the way that all these different people can interact and, and you see how their conceptions of each other change, I think is really interesting. Okay, looking at some of the other questions. Uh, Craig says he loves the book, but he felt like Katie Halsey's character could have been more significant, uh, wants to live, uh, and he says he's a university administrator, wants to live more like work, but he has to serve students. Well, Craig, I don't think that any, that there's an implication from the author, at least, that uh, it's, it's uh, wrong to serve uh, students or wrong to serve others uh, in an unqualified way. Um, Katie is a social worker, that's true, uh, and she doesn't seem to have much self-respect for reasons we've discussed, but every profession is concerned with providing a value to other people in trade for other values. I mean, Rourke is building buildings for his clients. Um, and at, well, I can't remember if we've read this part already or if it's still coming up, but at one point uh, Rourke says to one of his clients, I think it's to Austin Heller, I'm not building mausoleums. I'm not building homes for the dead. I'm building them for people. So there is he achieves his own self-respect by being able to produce things of value. And yeah, there are things of value to other people. The, the difference between him and someone like Catherine is uh, whether the self-respect comes from the activity, from the activity of creation, or from the fact that it's for other people. And Catherine is trying to get it just from the fact that it's for other people not at all in any way related to her own creative activity. And there's another quote from Rourke that I know we've gotten to already. It's, it's when he says that he, um, he has clients in order to build. He doesn't build in order to have clients. So for him, it's the building that is the primary and not the, you know, not the customers themselves. I mean, the customers are obviously important, but the building comes first for him. Yeah. So the work comes first. There's lots of ways to have customers, there's lots of ways to have clients, uh, there's lots of ways to provide value to other people. You have to choose the, the way that uh, matters to you. That's, that's where the I comes in, that's where the self comes in, that's where you choose a value. All right, well, we're over time. Um, uh, thanks a lot, everyone, um, for your comments and questions. And uh, we will have another meeting next week, Friday. Uh, actually, let me put the screen share up really quickly because I was able to fix a problem that I was having with it previously. Um, I think I was able to fix it. Yes. And here it is. So this is, I was telling people about, uh, we're going to have our regular meeting next week, Friday, to talk about part four, uh, the first half of part four. But the week after that, the week of May 15th to the 16th, that Friday's event will be canceled because you can go to this 
conference, Ocon Live. Go to einrand.org slash Ocon Live. Uh, find out what uh, the program is, who the speakers are, what the topic, the theme is living life with a purpose. There's obviously some affinity and overlap with what we've discussed in the Fountainhead. So some of you may be interested in this. Uh, so that will happen. But then once we're done, uh, we'll resume our normal schedule. Our final uh, meeting will be May 21st, I believe. And that will be uh, to talk about the last half of part four and to do another extra hour of Q&A. So uh, I will just quickly, that ah, didn't work. I've had some PowerPoint problems today because new things I was trying to do. Oh, well, I'll stop it and stop bothering you. Uh, thanks again, Paul, for showing up. And thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all next week.